morning, everyone. <laughs> good to see you all. Yeah. Good to see all of you all. Yeah. Right, the camera can't see everything, so I'm going to yeah. speak like there's 50 people in here. Uh, welcome to a new season of Primetime at the BU Library. Primetime is a collaborative project between the Friends of the BU Library, faculty development, and many other offices on campus, which celebrates learning beyond the classroom through the experiences and accomplishments of Bethel faculty, students, and staff. Past seasons of Primetime are available in the BU Digital Library which can be found on the library's homepage. Next Tuesday, Chris Garrett and Sam Mulberry will show us their creative approach in redesigning History 290 in a talk about teaching presentation entitled Past and Presence, Rethinking the Intro Course. Today, we welcome Dr. Dan Rotar as he shares practical ideas about dealing with emotional sideshows when discussing controversial subjects and issues in your classes and talk about teaching presentation entitled Managing the Side Shows. Let's welcome Dan this morning. No, stay seated, everybody. <laughs> Please. You know, um, I got my start a number of years ago um, as a beginning preacher. Uh, I was all of 19, 20 years old, and I was speaking at a uh, rescue mission downtown Des Moines and I had my little Baptist suit on and I had my sermon all ready to go and as I'm preaching away a guy stands up at the rescue mission and says at the top of his voice you don't know what the H-E double hockey sticks you're talking about and that was my first first reality as a young preacher, that it's not always going to go according to the way it is in your notes. And so I combine a number of experiences with some um, teaching I received a number of years ago from the Mennonites. Uh, I'm a credentialed mediator, and, and I was trained by the Mennonites, and they, they used to always say, the issue is never the issue. And I know was in my training, whether it's as a mediator, educator, pastor, therapist, whatever it is, whatever you see going on in front of you is probably not the issue. And so there's a couple of things that I want to just tease out for the next few moments. Let's try to keep the crowd noise down. Erica, please. Let's just settle down just a little bit. Um, a number of years ago, I, I came under the teaching. It's, it's really, really good teaching from a guy named Leonard Sweet. And he's written a number of books, Postmodern Pilgrims. Uh, he wrote a book called The Gospel According to Starbucks. Um, wrote, wrote a number of, of good books, Soul Tsunami. And, you know, he wrote 10, 12 years ago, but what he said is the way people process information, your generation, if you don't mind, Erica, is way way different than mine. You have now entered into, and we need to know this stuff, you have now entered into what we call epic learning. And what happens is, Sweet breaks this down, obviously tells you what the acrostic is. E is experiential, meaning um, the days of the talking head are over. The classroom, the church environment, if you would, needs to be an experience. It, it can no longer be what Sweet calls, you can't be the sage on the stage, now you have to be the guide on the side. Which, I, it, it's cutesy with words, but it's really true. The days of this person standing here, top down, just dispensing information, those days are done. Could be because the average attention span is only about seven minutes, which is fascinating. But anyway, he, and then he, he, he talks about participatory, meaning uh, we're in environments now, learning environments, where the student, though you may not be able to pick this up, really do want to participate. They want to be a part of the process. And then image. I admitted to you last time I did this talk about teaching 
that some of the best decisions that I've forged in my life have not been on the heels of a really, really good lecture or on the heels of a really good sermon, to be honest with you. It's been on the heels maybe of a really good movie or a really good play where I've just sat there and I thought, wow, why are these images staying with me so profound? Why do I still, to this day, and this is 20 years later, do I still have this image of Oscar Schindler taking that, that pen and saying, I could, I could have bought one, maybe two more people. You know, why, why does that stay with me longer? Why do the scenes from Slope and Dog Millionaire stay with me longer? Judy and I just watched 12 Years a Slave. Why does that stay with me longer than linear talk? It's because we're now in a very image-driven world. I personally welcome that. Um, I'm kind of an old guy. I'm not one who wants to go back to VHS. Bob, I don't want to <laughs> just don't take us back. Not a good idea. But I, 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 I do believe we're in a day where Experience, participation, image, and then this whole communal thing. I was just telling Brett, last night while I'm watching Pittsburgh Pirates get beat up, I'm texting my son, and then we would decide we're going to uh, FaceTime a little bit. And you know, it's not there. He's in New York, I'm here. It's not the same. But it's pretty good. It's pretty good, the, the communal side of it. So I tell you all that because... Um, and I got nothing. If you teach statistics, I, I got nothing for you. I, I don't know how, how you can make that an experience. Where's Joel when I need him? <laughs> he, could, he could tell me. But here's a couple of things that I've learned down through the years about what I call managing the sideshow. And, and I, I struggled, you guys, with the whole sideshow metaphor because it's, it's for the most part, kind of negative. So by the time we're done today, I want to maybe empower you that there's times where you welcome the side and you take whatever is going on in the room and say, we should probably explore this a little bit further. And I'll tell you a couple of stories about that. The stories as they relate to some of the students here are from 10, 12 years ago, back when you were the students. Uh, so, that, so that you're not sitting there and saying, Eric's like, whoa, he's talking about me. You know? yeah. No, it, it's, my students have really uh, helped me undergird, if you don't mind, some of this stuff about managing the sideshows. Scripture informs us on this, and this is my prayer. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God okay keyword discern um, I don't have the gift my wife does. Drives me nuts. But um, what do you think discernment is? Erica, got any idea what discernment is? Yep. To tease out, to know the difference. Tease out. That's good. Be able to judge. Judge. Yep. Gave you a little bit of time. Yeah, yeah. It's a fascinating word in the New Testament. It's a fishing term. For when the fisher, the fishermen, anglers. Yeah. <laughs> anglers. Thank you. When the anglers would would take the fish and they would fillet the fish, and then feel for the bones, discern. So there's a, not a physical feeling component to this, but it's a component that says, hmm, there's something going on here. I'm not quite sure what it is. So I'm going to hang with it long enough to see. Now, when we talk about discernment a lot of times, 
we, we talk about it in terms of right or wrong. But Paul says, you know, I think you got the right or wrong thing down. I, I think you got that part figured out. Let me help you figure out what's best. That, that's what he's saying. Now, the Church of Philippi could do that, they, for the most part. Kind of had their act together. And so he's, he's writing to them and saying, I, I want you to think through what is best. So I designed maybe some ideas for all of you, the hordes of you, uh, that I, I think have helped me. And, and I've, I've made some mistakes in this area, and if time allows, hopefully it doesn't, I'll, I'll tell you about those mistakes. Because um, I really have bought into the experiential, participatory, the image-driven, and the communal side of teaching. I, I really have. But there's a price to pay for that. If you really are going to get in there and mix it up about controversial stuff, as we should as Christ following people and as a Christian liberal arts university. We need to move into the gray. We need to create some tension. And there's this price to be paid. And we'll talk about that price in just a second. But here, here's here's what I mean by sideshows. And, and it, it runs quite a gamut, y'all. Um, there's there's sideshows that we need to manage regularly, and that is one of our students or two of our students might be back there just kind of dinking around on Facebook, and it becomes a sideshow because you stayed up half the night the night before getting ready for this lesson plan, and there's two people back there messing with stuff. That's a sideshow. But I'm, I'm talking about the deeper stuff. I'm talking about the stuff that happens and quite frankly just happened recently in one of my classes where as we were talking about how the homosexual population is uh, in large part in some parts of the country how they are treated by evangelicals. Well, it wasn't in it wasn't in my lesson plan that day. Truth be told, I don't have a lesson plan. But it, it it wasn't in my list of things to do that day to pursue that person's story, but that person in the class just began to tell of all the pain that her friend experienced in a Christian environment by admitting some struggles with sexual orientation. Now, we'll come back to this in just a second, but here's, here's what I was taught, and therefore I'm going to give it to you. Um, we're, we're taught as a mediator that when something's going on that you didn't plan, the first thing you do is check what's going on in me. When, when Paul writes to young Timothy, I don't know if you had this in mind or not, but when Paul writes to young Timothy and he says, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. I, I appreciate the fact that the Holy Spirit guided those words to be captured and I'm glad the Holy Spirit guided those words to be captured in that order. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Now, back to the H E double L <laughs> comment that this guy made. I lost it, Erica. I, you know, here I am preaching my first sermon. I got the whole deal going on. I just lost it. Yeah. The sideshow that created me, I, I couldn't read Cool. So, Later on, I began to adopt certain strategies of when something is going on in the environment to just quickly say, okay, Rota, what's going on with you? What's going on? I was preaching at a church uh, church, and I was preaching on uh, the issue of sexuality, and it's, it's interesting how word gets around that because you teach it at a university, you must know what you're talking about. So I've been invited into a couple churches to talk about it. And I, I could see in the background that, that as I was teaching, there's a, there's a guy just regularly 
thumbing through the scriptures. <laughs> what what I what I sense is as I'm on probation. I, I'm on probation. Um, and right in the middle of the talk, he just stands up and at the top of his voice says, "That is not what my Bible teaches." And I don't always get it right, but but at that point I simmed down. Clarify my Bible. I'm, I'm teaching out of 1 Corinthians 6 out of the translation that may be different than yours. I think you're not teaching the truth. I'm not sure why we even brought you here. So this is getting interesting now. And then what I did is I checked my spirit at the door right away because part of my self awareness is I'm really good with words. And I can get pretty ticked off really quickly. And I can use those words to absolutely shred. I'm, I'm just being honest. Because I've done it before. But I didn't that day. I took a break. I said, tell you what. Seems to be a little bit warm in here. Let's just take a break. Let's take like five minutes and come back. And I had a chance to go over and talk to that guy. And I said, you know, knock it off. I said, can, can you can you wait until we're done? And then, then we'll have a discussion, if you want, about translation. Remember, remember what the Mennonites told me. The issue is never the issue. So what appears to be going on in front of you could be about translation. I doubt it. I doubt it. Now, as I heard that person's story after the talk, then I understand, understood why he was so amped up about. That's not what my Bible says. Because he had members of his family making choices that were hurtful. So, the issue's never the issue. But anyway, it, it just for what it's worth, and again, if you teach statistics, I have no idea what you should do. But uh, I don't, can you make that controversial? Can you? <sighs> Fascinating. Fascinating. I teach in a uh, demon program over at the seminary, and I had a student from Nigeria in classes. He's just delightful. One of the sideshows he would create once in a while was we'd be sitting there, and all of a sudden he'd break out in song. <laughs> and it was beautiful. And why well, it made me cry at then. I, but we, seriously, I'd be talking to him, but. So good. Then, at the end of one of the talks, lectures, whatever it is we were doing over there, he said, You Western folks, you're so individualistic. He said, we forge decisions based on is this going to be good for the village or not? I mean, he said, In my time here, I've seen so many TV commercials where it's about you. He says, I've even heard that. It's about you this week at Fantastic Sam's or whatever. You know, <laughs> it's about you this week. And he said, how do you guys do this? So right in class, I said, no, you tell us, how do you do it? Because I think right now, whatever we have to say can wait till we hear your story about how you forge decisions that are for the good of the village. Now, back to your sideshows that are created in the classroom. I don't think there's a formula for this, and it requires a much higher level of discernment than I have. But there are times when something will, will crop up, and in your heart of hearts, you're saying, okay, I didn't plan on this. This might be good for the rest. Give me an example. I'm sorry, how much time do I, when do I land the plane? Uh, oh, okay. Um, a number of years ago in one of my classes, I had shown, it's, it, it's killing us softly for, it's a, it's a video here. It's, it's very good. It's, it's a study done on uh, 
women's uh, body image and self-esteem up against the backdrop of what the media tells you you are. So as I'm showing the video, just bits and pieces of it, I, I look over and I, I see one of my female students crying. So I, I stopped the video and I said, are, are you okay? And she says, yeah. I said, do you want to tell your story or is that too deep? She said, no, I'll tell my story. And she began to tell her story of how she was dismissed from a worship team at a church because she had put on a little weight. I mean, they didn't tell her that, but she knew the issue's not the issue. It was a chance to tell her story. And sure enough, this wasn't in my lesson plan because I don't have one, but it wasn't in my plan of things to do. But it seemed like, it seemed like this would be good for the village to not only hear her story. And sure enough, after she told her story, a couple other people said, you know, actually, I've been dissed because of body image too. That's what I'm talking about. Um, here's where it gets kind of dicey. What, what if the student's story is trying to steal a moment? In other words, as Sandra Wilson says, hurt people hurt people. What if their story is running the show? Let me, let me stop here and ask, ask you all. How do you know? Maybe I'm supposed to provide the answer to that, but how, how do you, how, how would you know? How would you know if whatever's going on here is probably more about that student and his journey and his pain, or this is good for the village? Talk to me. What, what, are, what are some clues that you've picked up down through the years that you might say, hmm, we should probably go with this, or maybe we shouldn't? Any ideas? Great. Well, part of it for me at least is how, and sometimes it doesn't matter, but how far off the track are we going with this in terms of, again, not necessarily a specific, like, I don't, I have a plan, right? but I, I don't mind going off the track if there's some resonance or some, some connection. Uh, so part of that has to do with that, and part of it has to do with, like you were saying, does, is this one person's story going to potentially at least yep. connect to other students, or is it really just a, a time to say, you know, I I understand your pain. I, let's talk about this after class. Okay. It's a tough call. It's a tough call, but I think you have to. It is about how it connects, or potentially connects, to the other students, and, and possibly right. to what you're dealing with in terms of the lesson. You, you use the word resonance. How, how how would we know? That's I think that really is for me that, trying to be as present to the spirit, to the moment, to the uh, uh, energy, emotion. And yep. 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 Yeah, I had an experience a number of years ago in one of my classrooms where um, I was talking about uh, I was telling a story about back in 1973 when I went to college at the University of Northern Iowa and I wrote out a check for $750 for room, board, tuition, books. But anyway, I was talking about the application at the University of Northern Iowa back in 1973. And in, on the application, there was a box you could check. And here's the exact words. Are you willing to live with a person of color? Those were the words on the application. So I just told that story. And one of my students got up and was ready to leave. And she said, that offends me, said, as well it should. But I'm just verbatim telling you the story. Different back in the 80s. She says, you didn't hear me. That offended me. You shouldn't have told the story. I said, OK, that's something for me to think about. But that was one situation where I said, all right, there's something kind of funky going on here. Maybe I made the right call. Maybe I didn't. But I should probably have a conversation. Come to find out that conversation later, it was amazing to me how deep this issue went. Now, I wouldn't have known that at the beginning of the class 
or the beginning of the story. But I like your word resonance. Sometimes you have a sense. Is, is this the right time to pursue this, or should I pursue this? Anybody else? How do you know? I love the teaching of John chapter 1 in the translation called The Message. And John 1.14 in The Message says, And the Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. I love that teaching. I love it. It's, it's like Jesus Jesus in the hood. It, it's, it's like, it's like, okay, Rota, I'm not going to keep my distance from you. I'm going to come down, and I'm going to live like you live, and I'm going to experience what you do. So it, we call that the incarnation. And there's there's some fascinating uh, teaching out there, some research on incarnational teaching, meaning you're not the sage on the stage. You're the guide on the side who helps your students not only wrestle with whatever you're talking about, but beyond the classroom, say, can I point you to somebody who maybe can pick this up with you? And in the 15, going on 16 years I've taught here, there's probably been, I don't know, nine or 10 venues where something happened in the classroom, it was a sideshow, dealt with it, but at the end of class, I said, can, is, is there some way I can help? I, I can't be your therapist. Because that'd be a dual relationship. But is there? Can I point you in the right direction? And a lot of times the answer is no. But more times than not, the answer is yeah. Th thanks for noticing. This is this is a pretty deep thing. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. And then I think Brett, you're you're hitting at this. What, what's the what's the emotional climate of the class? A um, number of years ago, I think it was when I was the interim campus pastor here, is when uh, Soul Force, a quality ride, came through. And it was a, just a fascinating experience. Created some angst on campus. But I'm one who like appreciates the angst. <laughs> My wife says, that just makes you crazy. I said, no, actually, it's out of that angst and out of the tension. I think we forge good and better decisions. But I remember um, around that time pre preparing for a particular class in, in human sexuality. And I realized whatever I had designed for that day to talk about would not be the right thing to talk about. So we shifted gears, broke stride with the syllabus for a day. I said, let's talk about this. What, what are you all experiencing as a result of this university creating venues where we could have courageous, honest dialogue? And that's essentially the way Jay Barnes, who was the provost at the time, said, we're going to create a situation where we can just have good, courageous, godly dialogue. And so we had that in class. And I'm, re I'm really, really thankful that it broke stride that day from the syllabus. I don't remember what we were going to talk about realize there, there's some stuff here that needs to be processed. Experienced it also in, in a different environment, but um, I was preaching in a church in Minneapolis the Sunday following the bridge collapse. And I had my nice little sermon five, six pages, which is about 20 minutes, 13 minutes over the attention span of a normal adult. But, you know, I, seriously, and, and I, I, I stood there, I looked at the notes, and I looked out there, and I could see this is not the right thing to do today. So I, I stepped away from the platform, and I said, all right. Does anybody know somebody? Hand shot. 
do, do any of you have somebody in the hospital? Hi. One hand. Do you want to tell your story? Sure, I'd like to tell my story. It comes up. I don't always get this right, but sometimes the emotional climate of the classroom, of the congregation, if you believe it, is, it's probably not a good idea for you to go with what you thought you should go with. And then, I, you notice I'm not giving you formulas for this. I love your word resonant. Sometimes you just have to discern. And by the way, for those of us that don't have the gift of discernment, find somebody who does. What I will do at the beginning of the semester is I'll, I'll with, with a couple of students who I can sense have some wisdom, have some discernment, I'll debrief with them about third or fourth class. If something happens, if a sideshow happens, I'll say, do you guys think we should pursue this more? Really, I'll pull them together and we'll go over to the DC and I'll say, do you sense it'd be a good idea? And there's been a number of times that, no, it's enough. And I kind of want to keep going, but I trust that they, they know what they're talking about. That's the guy on the side. And then, would this be a good time to create a side show? Would this be, you know, you're sensing that there's this low grade angst. And I guess you can get up there and talk about whatever you want to talk about. But you can tell it's not going to land anywhere. So why not take the risk to say, should, should we take last discussion a little further? In one of my classes, Erica, I don't know if there's one you, what would you take? Human sexuality and Christians in conflict. It's in my Christians in conflict class. Um, I, I wonder, if, did I show the Westboro Baptist Church document? Okay. Well, in, in, in one of my classes, Christians in Conflict class, I show portions of a documentary I own called Fall from Grace. It's the Fred Phelps Westboro Baptist Church story. And there's a scene in there where um, a bunch of bikers, a bunch of Harley bikers, come and drown out the military, uh, drown out the protesters. They go to different places and just crank up their Harleys so you don't have to hear protests. Whereas a young man in my class kind of sitting where Deb is, he starts to cry. Good night, we're talking. What, what are you doing? And so I said, are you going to be okay? And he says, yeah. And then he says, can I tell my story? I said, sure. He said, my dad is one of those bikers. <laughs> he says, and I, I couldn't be prouder than I am right now. His dad, retired, takes his Harley and goes, wherever the protesters are going to be, just cranks up his Harley, and that's it. <laughs> and I think, and he says, so proud. So it was one of those moments where I'm, I'm glad I paid attention. And it's not hard to pay attention when somebody's crying. But a lot of times, you just got to discern, what's going on here? Should I pursue it? Or should I not? Make sense? I don't like question and answer. I like Brian McLaren's question and response. Because there's this implication I'm talking and you're not the answer. Do we have some questions? Do we have some comments? Well, I get in trouble for putting the H E double hockey sticks out there. I cut that out of the video. <laughs> I did make a note of it. Did you? I appreciate that. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Thanks, you all. And God bless you. Can I, should we pray? Should we pray? Do I get paid extra? There's extra coffee. Lord Jesus, help us to be like you. Help us to be incarnational in our work. Help us to come alongside well. Help us to care. Help us to hear stories. Help us to be authentic in whatever authority we have, with students and with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, y'all.